Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Welcome back. You are listening to Money on Tap. My name is Seth Crossman. And I'm Ben Brayshaw. You can reach us at 855 226 8 Five five one or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And uh, this is this is going to be a great show for us today. I got to tell uh, you, Seth, we're going to be a little energized. I mean, our listeners probably have no idea that we just had like two hours of technical difficulties behind the anxiety <laughs> that's probably going to come out in this show. So I'm a little nervous. Um, I send that out to the compliance world that we listening to the show. Um, yeah. Have fun. Okay. Well. <laughs> So, hey, we're, we're going to tackle, you know, we get a lot of questions about this and that, right? When, um, when uh, you guys go ahead and send us in some questions about different topics and different things that we've covered. And, you know, we, we took a step back and kind of got a 30,000 foot view of what it is that we're really doing here on a regular basis. And we're getting you prepared for and educated to have a successful retirement. And we talk a lot about that in our practice and with our clients is, is, um, you know, making retirement a successful experience. You really only get one shot to uh, do this right the first time. And so we're going to cover 15 kind of steps, you know, the things that we just talk about on an ongoing basis. But this is a show for you to just kind of get out your, if you like to check the box, if you like to create the list and we got 15 in a row here that we're going to make it through if you're, eventually. If, if you're a prepper, this is your show. <laughs> this is 15 steps to prepare for retirement. This is not about the person who is retired. This is the person who is saying, hey, listen, I'm, I'm stepping into this. I want to see what retirement, what I can do, what, what, you know, what am I not doing? Let's check these boxes. We could have come up with 50 steps, honestly, folks, but uh, we narrowed it down to 15 in our uh, in our little debate here, and uh, we're, we're geared to go on this one. We are. Before we uh, step into that, we're going to go ahead and kick it off with Money in the News. Robinhood raises another $2.4 billion from shareholders. And if you if you haven't watched the news in the last couple of weeks, last week we were we were covering some of these crazy trades that are going on. Um, Reddit, you know, uh, subscribers to different feeds were just charging the market with uh, a few different stocks, GameStop being one of them. And it created a whole other scenario in the market that we've just never seen from a brokerage uh, brokerage house perspective trading platform perspective i i think it's tremendously interesting that robin hood is the name of the company who i think has just robbed millions upon millions of average investors all day long i know that there's a number of advisors out there that would disagree with this but i, I had a debate yesterday with one but i gotta be honest with you i um I think it's it's amazing that they have tempered it to you you know you could only buy 10 shares of like the movie company and you could only buy you know x number of shares of these like it was literally down to 10 shares of AMC and I'm thinking to myself that thing was trading between 8 and 15 dollars or something like that so that's like 80 to 150 dollars you could invest in this company and I'm thinking about here you have all these hedge fund guys who are shorting this stock and all they're doing is helping. And then you have TD Ameritrade and all these other broker dealers, you know, out there doing the same thing, all the limitations across the board. And all they're doing is playing into the hands of those who are shorting these companies by limiting the amount of buys. If, you know, if you have more buys, the price goes up. You have more sells, the price goes down. So if you limit the number of buys, you're limiting the growth on these assets. And I think it's amazing that 
This isn't, com- I mean, this is sellout world to, as far as I'm concerned, this is a sellout to the hedge fund companies. These Gen Zers, you know what? We all deserve this. We sent all of Gen Z home in college and in high school. We sent them home and said, you have to stay home. And they figured out how to overthrow the hedge funds. I mean, you know, my hat's off to the Gen Zers because this is hilarious. <laughs> I've been joking around with my son about this stuff. He's He's got a little, you know... Up my account, and we help him trade it, and you know it's it's funny, and we've had some great laughs. He's learned a ton of stuff, but he's literally watching all of these social media pieces, and I got to tell you, this is such a double standard in so many ways. I mean, the first thing, I mean, I could go, I have an entire soapbox for this, but I'm looking at, you know, there's these, you know, there's these big hedge fund companies, and they have put hundreds of thousands of companies out of business, shorting their stock burying these companies, putting tens or hundreds of millions of people out of business, job losses across the board. You know, and there's probably like six guys, I heard this illustration on CNBC, there's like probably six guys smoking a cigar, having a you know drink of scotch, and they all decide, hey, listen, we're going to go after one company, we're going to short it, we're going to push the stock down, and we're going to make a ton of money. And they, they literally, people lose their 401ks, their houses, their cars, everything. And these guys drive off in their Lamborghinis. We know this story. It's all over Wall Street. Any movie you want to go watch, it's there. It's the truth. It's what happens. But now Gen Z decides to do this in the open public in front of everybody. These guys are doing it behind closed doors so no one knows. And the open public is having an open forum. They don't have any insider information. They're just saying, hey, listen, if we go and buy this stock... Like AMC, for instance, one guy said, we saved like 14,000 popcorn jobs. I mean, AMC was able to go get loans and sell stock at a higher rate than the interest rate they pay. I mean, there was so much benefit for AMC. I'm shocked that they're not going to be launching a massive lawsuit against all these companies. And if you're not AMC, you need to get better legal advice because they're forcing your stock down by limiting the number of buys. I think this is complete treachery. This is this is wrong. There's there's no there's no rhyme or reason to this. They should if you have and they're talking about leverage and margin and I said to somebody else, I go, That's fine. Make everyone buy it in cash. But make the hedge funds do it too, because you're concerned about a sixty percent margin ratio and borrowing money to buy stock. Well the hedge funds only need to have ten percent down. You gotta have <laughs> you gotta have a whole heck of a lot more than that. So what makes it right for them but you know, you can't. So I think it has to be an even, fair playing field. And here you got Robin Hood, who's named after the guy who's given everybody everything, right? And they're taking everything away. And I'm listening to um, Dave Fortnoy and all these people. They're, they're after Robin Hood, man. And, and to, to double down on this, Seth, they raised $2.4 billion from the shareholders. And yet, guess what? They, they, they postponed their IPO going public. Because they know there's people out there that Dave Fortnoy and all these other guys who are probably just going to bury this company with short sales. <laughs> 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 so, I think it's I think it's funny and and I you know what I'm I'm not sure about the financial you know how much backing they need to have for different assets, but when they went out last Thursday and got the three point four billion dollars that they needed for backing for this, at that point in time, if that backing was what they needed. Then at that they should have released or you know released all those limits. You know if they got the backing they should be fine. I mean, and, but if anything they started restricting further, which tells me. And now they got another two point four billion. So that's, I mean, we're talking six billion bucks that you didn't even have, even anything close to either one of those numbers alone, and you still can't back more than ten shares of AMC or you know whatever five shares of GameStop or, you know. Any number of these, you know, things. I, I, it's wrong. It's straight up wrong. It's it's interesting that this is the preferred um, clearinghouse for the, the Gen Z generation that is that has really been driving a lot of the the well, as far as we understand, it's been driving a lot of the numbers between uh, GameStop and and the shorts on the the hedge funds, uh, and it's it's the one that shut it down. And I wonder if I wonder. I really wonder what is what's that going to do for their business? Are they just going to basically move over to one of the other clearing houses? Is that the solve, or do they, you know? 
Do, well, is it a lawsuit? Well, that's where, where does this? I know that's, where does this wind up? It's totally interesting because they had like the most accounts open on Friday in any one day for them, and I'm just thinking all the Gen Zers who probably opened up eight accounts to buy eighty shares. <laughs> You know, oh, that's a, yeah. I think okay. that's a big, huge. I bet you they're going to find there's a ton of like fraudulent accounts out there, but Jeez. but the thing is, is that you know everyone's using Robinhood because they don't charge you fees to trade, so they make their money by the you know the large volume of trades. They make the money between the buy and the sell. There's always a difference between those numbers. It's not like if you're selling a stock for ten dollars, Seth, and I'm buying a stock for ten dollars. Well, you're not selling for 10. I mean, there's people in between. So you might sell it for 9.9 and I buy it for 10.1. The reasoning there between the the shutting down the sales or the trades was because of the liquidity issue of them having to make up the losses out of their, basically their covering the losses from, from their clearing house. And that's where they needed the additional liquidity. But the fact that they didn't come back into the, to unrestricted trade, which that's never has that this has just never happened before we've never seen the clearinghouse go ahead and start start restricting yeah why would you and trading why would you want to slow your trading down when you get paid based on each trade you'd want as many trades as possible to go through so you're like whatever they should have just shut down margin and said here you go cash only trades here on out whatever whatever they needed to do to protect the financials and then slowly opened up margin again and forget this whole craziness of, you know, limiting. Um, it's just, it's wrong. It's silly. It's, uh, it's, they sold out to the big boys. And, you know, I was reading another article, Seth, I was listening to something about how, you know, all these other firms had put like automatic stop losses on purchase of stocks. And so these hedge funds were walking the stock down, which is selling it to each other and, and just slowly walking the price of the stock down till they hit those stop losses to force all the more sales so they could sell the rest of their stock. It was amazing. So they figured out another way to take advantage of, you know, these companies are just protecting us. Well, I mean, there's like all these stories out there of all these people who are making a bunch of money who are not hedge funds. Who, how did you protect? You know, I just, listen, free and fair market. That's the way it needs to be. If it, if you, if one person can do it, everyone else can. And the fact that they're doing it in the open, in their face, is tough luck for them. And and you know what? The hedge funds, you know, you guys, I understand you run pensions and everything else, but you're in a new normal and you need to learn how to do it that way. And and the SEC, there's going to be a zillion complaints. All these companies are going to get sued. And you know what? They're probably going to protect them all. And they're going to yeah. base it on trying to protect the average investor. You know, all they've done is protect themselves. And that's that's what's wrong. And I, I firmly believe that. Hey, I I really like your soapbox. Sorry, there. that was a <laughs> that was a, that was a good rant. Let's get on the next one. We got another good soapbox here, which should really get get some people moving. Seth, <laughs> this is probably not or, the one we should do next. After we're not moving, or after hours uh, of of technical problems, this is probably getting us a little energized. <laughs> I was concerned about that. Hey, did did you actually hit record? I just want to double check. Yeah, so I, I, we're recording. We're recording. <laughs> so. Okay. Listen, up next, who wants to talk COVID? The COVID vaccines, COVID vaccines. So um, stat news. Can, can I go back to calling this the Wuhan virus? I call it the China virus. The, I, it's, you know, it's so China. interesting part of it that, that, that we don't call it the Wuhan virus. Like everything else has always, always gotten the, the regional name or, or something like that attached. And, you know, apparently... You know, China, China did not appreciate people calling it the Wuhan virus, and they, they've won the information, the, the, the language oh, did you hear barrier they, they, here. They destroyed a ton of the material and then hired a team to prove it wasn't from Wuhan. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, hold on a second here. <laughs> so you destroy all your material, and then you say, here, hey, look on, over there. Come look on in, scientists. <laughs> it's not China. It's not Wuhan. Anyways, from Stat News, we have comparing the COVID-19 vaccines developed by Pfizer Moderna and Johnson and Johnson. Now J and J is coming out with a vaccine has not been approved yet. Now this is a really complicated conversation because a lot of people don't really understand this. And I think I think for the article does a pretty good job of explaining differences here. And I think for our listeners, if you don't listen to anything, you need to listen to this today because I know we've talked briefly about it. But Moderna and Pfizer have come out with an mRNA shot. Okay, it's not a vaccine. There is no vaccine 
to it. It is not a vaccine. It never will be a vaccine. It is a gene therapy. And that and needs to be... And it, it's experimental. Yeah, and it's experimental. So you need to walk into these two things knowing that. And if you disagree, um, tough luck, because that's the facts. And the the thing about this is that they don't know. They've never They've never altered mRNA before. Okay, in humans, in humans, intentionally, it happens, and usually when mRNA gets altered, it's usually from a response to a traditional vaccine, um, which your body then creates an autoimmune response and starts attacking something in your body. I know a lot about this because I am a vax injured person. Okay, I received vaccines, and I actually ended up getting transverse myelitis in college. Seth was witness to this back in those days, and I was paralyzed from the neck down for about two weeks of my life. And and this is something that is very near and dear to me because I will never stick another needle in my arm and take the chance of that because when you can't move and you, you, you cannot feel your hands and your feet, let me tell you, you'll live life shorter and live with all of those things and you will ever take that risk again. Yeah. And And what's really scary is, as I'm reading a number of the articles, these mRNA vaccine shots, as much as they're saying that they're perfectly healthy and fine, there are a number of autoimmune responses, transverse myelitis being one of the top ones. I think you told me that too, Seth, um, yep. which, is a, which is a scary thing because having had it, it is not a joke. Um, I'm very fortunate, and I thank God every day that I have uh, all of those movements back. Um, it's a miracle, and I, um, I thank the good Lord he, he, he healed me. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that, you know, even though I probably wouldn't take any of these, well, I won't take any of these, um, I would say that the Pfizer vaccine, which is a traditional vaccine, is one that... No, Johnson & Johnson. Oh, I said Pfizer. Pfizer. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah Johnson & Johnson is a traditional vaccine. Thank you, Seth. And that's, and that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's literally that's exposing yourself to the SARS spike and giving it there and, you know, trying to work through building the antibodies and, and all of those things. I mean, from that standpoint, that's something that I'm probably more open to, I guess, from that perspective. I'm not going to get one, but if I were looking at these things, I would say I'm going to take the experiment off the table, and I'm going to look at J&J, who has the largest, you know, number of uh, testing out there, even though it's not approved. And I would probably say that would be the best of the three worst. Well, it's it's something we know versus something that we, we have absolutely zero uh, experience releasing into a population. I mean, really, this is, this is, it's a, these are experimental. We don't have human really long-term study trials. They didn't really roll this out and, and try them on animals, which is traditionally what they've done. But the, the challenges with this SARS-2, uh, or Wuhan, you know, virus vaccinations are, or biological experiment is what it is at this point is, um, you know, they, they, they have tried to create a, a vaccine or an MRNA. Um, what did you call it, Ben? Therapy or? Yeah, gene therapy. It's a gene, gene therapy. therapy. Yeah. So they've, they tried that with the SARS-1 virus, which is a 78% identical to the SARS-2 virus. And when they released the animals back into the wild they, to get an exposure or a re-exposure to that same virus, um, they died. Yeah. And there's, so, and there's a lot of people who, I mean, they're not giving credence to a lot of the, I mean, you can, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the, um, the suppressed videos that, you know, Facebook has taken down saying it's not true. This yeah, didn't happen. Yeah. Um, you know, Hank Aaron, I think had the shot 18 days before he died. Larry King had it a day or two before he died. I mean, there's a doctor, OBGYN in Florida. He, he had a platelet issue. His wife insists it was from his second shot. He was a big vaccine uh, proponent at the time. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there that I, I'm not sure <clears throat> that I'm, I, I know either way f- for certain. So I can't speak to that. But what I would say is that it's a 99.9% survival rate. I mean, that's better than the flu. That's better than almost anything else out there. And mm. honestly, the more and more people that get it, the lower that death toll goes. I mean, we could be at 99.5 soon 
with the number of people that are going to contract this. And and that's not even disputing numbers. That's not even wondering whether, you know, the number of people who died, whether they were tabulated this way. Like there's there's all sorts of conversation around, you know, the 400,000 people who have tragically died during this time period that some of them are not COVID. Well, let's just say they all are COVID. It's still a 99.9% survival rate. So, we, you know, I'm not too psyched about slapping a experimental shot in my arm. Now, some people are okay with that. And, and you know, thank you for being willing to step into the void, I guess. I mean, that's... that's, yeah. that's if you have an altruistic type of a, of a motive yeah. here, absolutely appreciate it. Because, you know, there's going to be a lot that's going to be learned um, down the road about this. Um, there's the effect on the placenta and the wall of the placenta. When people contract COVID, if they're, they're pregnant, there's a chance of losing the pregnancy because that's one of the interactions that it has. But with the mRNA, basically, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create this ongoing um, COVID type of a, of a presence. Um, and yeah. so they don't really know what that is. I was going to say, I just, I just saw that the FDA said that uh, hydroxychloroquine. You know that that's okay. That they that they that they back it again after sixty years of keeping it uh, keeping it put going and everybody taking it. Now now it's back and everybody's okay to take it again. I thought that was amazing. Yeah, no, I thought that was funny too. So yeah, you know, there's apparently just, it's pretty effective too in in really treating the, uh, the early onset of of COVID. There's a, there's a lot of those things. I think Invermectin was another thing I heard that did it. Yep. But I, I also heard that vitamin yeah. D is almost an essential item. In your health, in this scenario, uh, doctor friend of mine said that uh, the second you walk into the into the hospital, they literally are overdosing you in vitamin D. Mm-hmm. So, um, Zinc. yeah, but vitamin D, he said, is literally the keyest component. So that's interesting, and I think uh, you know if you have thoughts and questions, which I'm sure every listener does. Feel free to email us at info at yourmoneyontap dot com and. Uh, <laughs> Happy to push this along, and you're welcome to look at stat, uh, statnews.com for this article by Helen Branswell. Last and not least, and I know we've gone a little bit longer in our Money in the News, but uh, real quick, Jeff Bezos is going to step down as the Amazon CEO, and Andy Jazzy is going to take over in Q3 this year. What do you think of that, Seth? Unbelievable what Jeff has created and, and built and just Amazon is this, the story of starting in 1994, selling books online and turned into, you know, the, the retailer that we know today. And that's primarily what most people uh, identify Amazon as is, you know, the app on their phone, they buy the thing and they get it showing up next day. Great service um, and all, all the rest of that. But really the a- AWS is which their their servers that they host so much the cloud Based servers that they host uh, so many people or don't host anymore or refuse to host <laughs> yeah. some people. Let's not get under <laughs> that bandwagon. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So. I got I to gotta tell you, Seth. I mean, I'm on round three here. We have totally stopped <laughs> buying off of Amazon. 100%. Good for you. I mean, like, I, I mean, I don't know if that's forever and. You know, if we get caught in a pinch, maybe we will. But we went from massive Amazon users to like almost zero overnight. Curious, what did you substitute? Or are you are you just, just keeping it all local? Direct retailers. We've actually, you know, we actually research people on Amazon and then go buy from them directly without Amazon. <laughs> so <laughs> good job. Um, so you didn't just make a, a, a total switch over to Walmart or something like that. You're you're actually going and finding them. So. Yeah, we're going directly to the real t- retailers, and then they don't have to pay a fee to Amazon at all, you know? So we're actually Good. helping a number of these smaller retailers anyways. You're listening to Money on Tap, or you're listening to Ben Brayshaw, pretty much, <laughs> on and his soapbox this morning. And uh, we, you can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. I think we have enough time. Believe it or not, we got 15, 15 things that you want to start – Get out your pen, start checking your boxes, create that list. We know all you you list makers out there love the list uh, of what do you need to do to prepare for retirement. Okay? Sounds good. We'll be right back. If you're listening today and, you know, your questions are outside the box of estate planning or financial planning or any number of the pieces that we kind of traditionally talk about, don't forget that Brayshaw Financial offers auto, home, and business insurance. And we have an entire department that handles all of that for you. Give us a call at 855-226-8551 and be happy to take care of those needs for you. Or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth.
Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. My name is Seth Cressman. I'm here with Ben Brayshaw. We are both planners and partners at Brayshaw Financial Group, and uh, we are going to be talking with you today about how are you going to prepare for retirement. We've got a list of 15 things here that we think are critical for you to start to write down uh, and put a priority around. And without taking too much more time, because we don't have a lot of it anymore, <laughs> we're going to jump in. <laughs> so, hey, number one, Ben, what do you have? You know, Seth, we for number one, we have uh, put down your fear. I mean, I think, I think we have to start somewhere. And, and the one thing that we, you and I were chatting about, which I thought was interesting, was that most people don't ever engage retirement because they have some sort of baseline fear. Like, I, I don't know what to do. I'm not, I don't know how to get started. I, I don't know if I have enough money. I don't, you know, they just don't even want to engage the fear. So they just put it aside. Unfortunately, a paralyzing thing in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Fear is debilitating. As a matter of fact, if you're, if you've made it this far into our show, you're doing good because so many people <laughs> will just be like, oh no, oh no, it's a financial show. I can't even listen to that because it's too scary for me to even try to even, you know, tackle any of these topics. But folks, this is it. You've, you've got to put that down and, um, and forge ahead. You know, God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And um, embrace that. Number two, we're, since we're going to put down fear, what's the best thing that we can do? We're going to rip the Band-Aid off and get going. Action. I, I like this. This is, this is like, it's a simple, Seth. I, I think our call to action here is really just 50, 25 bucks a month. Just start doing something into anything <laughs> for retirement. Yes. I don't care what yeah. it is, but it's just get going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, activity and action is one of the greatest things that you can just do to actually put down the financial fear. Because if you sit there contemplating, um, you know, that fear and what do I do to get out of that fear, you, you, doing something is going to get you out of it as quickly as any, anything else. And so we, we, that's where we go. Number three, if you have debt, grab one of those and start to pay it off. I, I love this. I, I love this. I, I mean, it's just one of those things, Seth. I mean, I, I mean, I know that we're probably not mainstream, you know, financial 101 guys out there like Dave Ramsey, you know, pay off all your debt and, and whatever. I do yeah. think you should get going on some sort of retirement piece just to get something moving because there's all this information around how much time behind your investment is where your gain comes from. So I think getting something going is just a, it's just a huge thing. I think doing some debt, you know, focusing on one piece of debt, you know, is really just a helpful item to look at Um, where a lot of people just say, just pay off all your debt and then we'll go deal with the rest. I I just don't think that $25 a month. And for some people that might be too much. I would even say do $25 a quarter for a retirement plan, whatever gets you moving forward in that way. So you get used to it. Um, I don't know. What do you, what are your thoughts, Seth? Yeah, I think we, we talked about this the other, the other day which was uh, people that have a, a, a $200,000 of school debt, um, college debt, or whatever that number is. It's quite large, uh, more proportionally now than it ever has been. But saying that you have to pay that off before you get going on you know, doing any kind of savings for your retirement, it's just not – I mean, this is just not the way 2020 or 2021 – uh, works anymore, folks. You just you're going to have to recognize that's going to be there for a while until at least you get to an earning, a place where your earning can start to kind of pay that down more significantly. But creating the habit early on and allowing for uh, allowing for those returns to happen and compound interest to work in your in your benefit is is really critical here. So, number four, let's go ahead and contribute to that 401k plan. If you if you don't have a 401k plan at your employer, start an IRA. These are qualified retirement accounts. That is going to reduce your taxability uh, at the end of the year. It's either going to, 401k is either going to reduce your income or the IRA is going to be something that's deductible at the end of the year towards, uh, towards those taxes. And it's going to allow for the compounding to happen 
without it being taxed. And it's going to be something that's going to start to put things out of sight, out of mind for you, because we want to start to have this long term goal where we're not dipping into or going over to this this savings plan over here to, you know, buy the car or something along those lines. Yeah, you know, that's and that really carries us into the next piece really quickly, which is, you know, your employer's match. If they have a match in the 401k, you need to be contributing. I mean, you need to figure out how to cut. You need to figure out how to do that. It's free money. You need to do this. I don't care what it is. You need to get the entire match. It is absolutely imperative that you figure that out. Um, you know, cut cable, cut cut Netflix, cut it all, get rid of it. You know, close your Amazon Prime account. Whatever it takes you to get that match, you do. Yeah. Snip, snip. <laughs> make a make a cut here on the coffee budget and and there on the the uh, the other piece that you know we all have that stuff that that we that we we like to do and we like to buy but if we can cut back a little bit on those then we can go this direction with it so as you're as you are getting that free money that brings us a lot, there's an order of operations for us a lot of the times when we're taking a look at you know financials and that first thing that we're going to see is hey what what's free money for us out there and that's going to be that 401k employee employer sponsored 401k plan the next thing that we take a look at is is there any tax free option can we get some tax free money going here for the future and you might actually have inside of that uh, 401k a Roth option for you to contribute to uh, and and if you don't then there's possibly a Roth IRA that you can open up that's uh, that's that's you taking that action on yourself, just like that IRA was earlier. And we're going to take a look and see what those things look like for you. Number seven, challenge yourself. Okay, as if this isn't already part of what we've been doing all along, you're going to challenge yourself every year to increase your contribution towards either the 401k, the Roth 401k, your IRA, or your Roth IRA. We're going to challenge you to start to increase that contribution. Now, if you do have um, a 401k, there's uh, or, you know, this might be an employee sponsored um, uh, pl- another kind of a employee sponsored plan, like a simple or something like that, too. There might be an option for you to do what's called an auto escalate. And that is something you can select. A lot of the times it's kind of preset at one percent a year for you to increase that contribution. You can always change that. You can always go and change those contribution levels for yourself, um, you know, down the road. But what we find is that if we have built into our our contributions something like this, we just don't even notice it, and it happens automatically, and we just live life. And you can just set yourself up for greater success rather than trying to go and 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 make those decisions every month or every year. Number eight, set goals and dreams, things that you are going to be looking for in retirement. And we just say, let's just talk about three things that you want, get it on paper, put it on that dream board next to your, your, uh, your, your desk at home. So it's right in front of you and you can have that perspective of what is it that you are looking forward to in retirement. What are some of the goals that you have towards those goals in retirement? This is one of the best things. This is, <laughs> this is what it's all about. This is the fun part. This is the part where I say, I usually tell people, go out and have dinner and focus on what it is that you guys want. You know, usually, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a situation where, you know, you might have some general conversations. I know my wife and I will chat about stuff, and we're probably more intentional about it because of my awareness of the of the world and the industry that I'm in. But I usually tell people it's amazing when they go out to dinner and they just intentionally talk about what does retirement look like to them and give each other like 15, 20 minutes just to say, these are all the things that are kind of floating in my head of what I think about retirement. It's amazing. It, it is literally amazing to me how much you will enjoy getting to hear your spouse communicate that and really figure out what you have in common and what maybe, you know, one person's thinking about traveling Europe and the other person's thinking about, you know, they, I'm just using an example of a gentleman said, well, I just want a trailer on the ocean in Florida with my boat and I'm just going to fish all day, every day. And then the wife's like, 
I'm going to be in Europe. I want to, I want to see Paris and I want to drink coffee under the Eiffel Tower and, you know, you know, night and day. And then, you know, eventually they bring that together. What does that look like in a unit and so forth? And this is what we, this is what we build all the steps for between start and finish to get there. That's the success we're talking about trying to find. That is the, I mean, you can build a retirement. I, I mean, I could build any retirement I want for somebody, but at the, at some point in time, if it's not what they want, it, it it's it's completely useless. So this is a core, massive project to do is to really line this out. And I would take notes about your spouse. I would enjoy this moment and appreciate why they even have those dreams and where that came from. Number nine. Now, this is not the one that uh, that that everybody wants to put onto the list, <laughs> but it's there and it's a it's a, a reality of where we're at today. And it's um, life expectancy and considering within life expectancy being longer, consider working longer. And, you know, even just like an extra five years is a lot of the time that we even can t- talk about first as a, you know, kind of a timeline. Let's just take a look and see what could that look like for you and how would that change your retirement as far as your income and some of the opportunities and some of those goals and dreams that you've maybe put out there uh, and make them just make it a little bit, give us a little bit of extra cushion. Just, just think about it. Yeah. I think this is one of those things. A lot of people take a consulting role. We've talked about that in the past and that's been a, that's been a good out for a lot of people because they don't have a long-term commitment, but they can step in when they, they want to make some money and the company needs them or vice versa. You know, number, um, Number 10, um, consider, you know, an abbreviated kind of job in retirement. Consider that, you know, step. Side hustle. The side, the side hustle. The <laughs> I have friends who, you know, who are in retirement um, and, uh, you know, I have one gentleman who works at a golf course because he loves golfing, saves on the membership fees and everything else. He does a little bit here in the morning, three days a week or something like that and, he can golf whenever he wants, no problem. And I, I had a, a buddy that uh, that retired, and he was a bailiff for like four years. He had a <laughs> he had a uh, a beverage company that he he sold, a family beverage company that he sold, and he you know, for four years he just went to work at the county as a bailiff. Said it was fascinating. Yeah, I mean. Not the no side golf, hustle. No I was. It's that, not no. the golf. It's not the golf story. I was. Uh, that sounded no, so great. Seth, get out of jail free. <laughs> you know, get out of jail free card with that gig. That gig. Um, but yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It's definitely an, an option to do, and I, I think. You know, when we talk about doing some sort of work after retirement, you know, a lot of people kind of turn their head and say, "No, no, I'm going to be done. I'm going to be done." And I got to tell you, there's not a lot of people that really feel that way once they are done. Like, they're they're usually like, you know, I, I have all this time. I, I was talking to one gentleman who, you know, he got a buyout from a company. He's like, I don't even need to go back to work. Two months after, he was like, I want to go to back to work, and my wife wants me back at work, <laughs> you know? And it's just one of those things. I mean, we all think that, hey, this is going to work out great, and I'm going to enjoy all this time. And he had all these plans. And he honestly just said, I really want to be back at work. And he was already applying for jobs like, I don't know, within 45 days of being out when he thought he was going to be maybe taking a six months to a year off. Um, it just wasn't that fun. He was like, I was home more days than I wanted to be. And, you know, the people I am still, you know, I'm friends with, they, they, they're working, so I can't do as much with them as they want. You know, so it was, it's complicated. Um Stepping away from work is one of those things, but I found that, and, and Seth, we referenced this article a few shows ago. I can't even recall where it was from, but I think it was, is it just a, just under half or just over half of Americans have less than $100,000 ready for retirement? Um, well, I guess you could say that either way, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I mean... percent of a... Of, of Americans have under and 50% have over. But $100,000, you know, is not nearly enough to retire. And, you know, that's a that's a problem. And so, 
you know, there's this group of people who are all, you know, kind of all set. And then there's a group of people who are kind of on track. And then there's this very, very large group of people who are just not prepared at all. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we kind of came into this and saying, listen, you know, how do we, 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 we engage the, we've engaged the baby boomers. We've engaged the retirees. We've engaged all these people. We've done shows on prepping, but we really need to give people a list of, of those things that you need to be doing or having a conversation about in, in order to make the whole piece come together. You know, so if you have under a hundred thousand dollars and you're not saving and it's a random pension that liquidated, um, or, or something like that, those are all things that are, you know, starts, but we need to keep it moving forward. And, you know, just because maybe you feel like you're behind the eight ball, there's no time better than getting started now. Speaking of moving forward, here we go. Create a social security account. Um, does that mean that you have to <laughs> start figuring out what you're going to pay in addition to social security or something like that? Not at all. What you need to do is you just need to go to the social security online portal there at social security administration website. And from there you can basically create your account where you can take a look and see what are your benefits. And right now, what are you scheduled to be able to claim at age uh, 62, three, four, age 70, and start to build a plan around that. And if you actually, if you need some help, we have on staff here, Brayshaw Financial Group, Ken, who retired from the Social Security Administration and is a tremendous asset to understanding what are the ins and the outs of the of Social Security. Uh, and it's great to work with a life person that can help that planning come together there. But that's the first step is just like, you know, create the account, take a look, see what you got. Yeah, he's great. Ken Barron is fantastic. He's got all the information you could possibly ever want. Uh, give us a call. Schedule that call. Get you know If you've got specific questions and we can't answer them, he is the number one on that for sure. 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Boy, we just got rolling there. Uh, and it's time for us to take a quick break. You're listening to Money on Tap. And we'll be right back. Hey folks, Seth Crossman Brayshaw Financial Group is our company and we bring to you Money on Tap. I say we, that's Ben and I. We have a lot of fun doing this show. And one of the things that we love about doing Money on Tap is that our goal for you to have access to the financial planning world, how do we think, what are we doing, what are we talking about, raising the bar of your financial education, it's, it's so critical. And that's what we're doing here. The other side of this is as well. We're financial planners. If you are looking to work with a financial planner, if you want to have that playbook for you to understand the important things right now and how you're going to get to your goals or how you're going to retire successfully, that's what we're doing as well. If you have $250,000 of investable assets, give us a call. It's free to you and it is worth your time to pick up that phone and give us a call and discover what complete wealth management looks like. Ben and I are excited about the opportunity to partner with you and give you that financial plan that's going to make the next step so much better understood and get you where you need to go. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. Welcome back. You are listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And if you're joining us late, then welcome. We're glad you're here. Ben and I are financial planners at Brayshaw Financial Group and partners. And we love educating you about retirement planning about finance. And that brings us to, hey, what is our topic today? How to prepare for retirement? And we're on number 12, which is educate yourself. If you're listening, you're doing it perfectly. You're doing it perfectly. Educating yourself. I, I love that. I love that. You know, I, I really, I mean, our podcast, I mean, I'm biased, obviously. I think there's a lot of strong content in here and all our archives have lots of different topics. Um, but I'm also encouraging people to, you know, pick up a financial book once in a while 
and try to expand your vocabulary in that. I mean, listening to our show and, and any other podcast or any of those types of financial medians will will help you do that too. But sometimes a book on something intentional where you're saying, hey, that's something they're talking about. I really want to understand more about that. Just creating that awareness of the of the of the the jargon that that exists and the kind of a building a little more depth will allow you to have a deeper conversation. I mean, one of the reasons that this show when we found value for it is is we'll encourage clients to if they have a question on something, we'll be like, "Hey, listen, don't hesitate to go to the podcast and listen to that." And when you have a question specific to that, just just come back to us because if we can expand your overall knowledge, maybe your question gets stronger, deeper, more intentional, more direct, more, you know, more crafted to accomplish, you know, the real concern that's underlying all the things going on in the background. Yeah. Some of the concepts are, are, are going to just take time. The first time that Ben and I have a conversation with you about this, or you hear it on, on air with us, it's, it, it, it might be the very first time you've ever even been introduced to, oh, I don't know, um, you know, life insurance as, you know, more than just life insurance, it, you know, the the be your own bank concept or something like that. And there's just a, a wealth of information. We'd love to direct you to some of the things that we we use as resources here as well to to educate yourself. But either way, just lifelong learning. It's it's really a it is proven to extend and and make retirement uh, just a, a more rich time of your life. And that's what this is about. And so we'd, we'd love the opportunity to be a part of that. And of course, we're going to say, hey, go listen to Money on Tap podcast. It's a great way to go ahead and queue up a podcast while you're on a walk or a run or in the car and 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 just continue to dive into uh, really what this uh, this list is all about, because that's this is what we do all the time on Money on Tap is, is we're talking about this list of 15 in different ways and different aspects um, and in, in more detail on other shows. So the next one would be number 13, for example, which is set up a will or trust. And, you know, we've, we've had several different uh, attorneys on air with us here in the past and we'll probably have them come back here again because, you know, things are going to be changing in this estate planning world. And what's important, for instance, in COVID uh, during you know shutdowns and the 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 um, uh, lockdowns was the the courthouses were not open and people were passing away and they weren't getting uh, people appointed to oversee the 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 will and so one of the ways that people were getting through this is getting a trust set up so that those assets could have direction regardless of a court having any uh, appointment over those those wills. But these are really super critical as a part of you putting together a retirement plan is to give some direction for what happens after you pass away. That's what that piece is all about. You know, I think the thing about the wills and trusts is that it's just overlooked constantly by most people. They They just don't, you know, if they do one, they do it when the kids are first born and, you know... Uncle, you know, Uncle Joey's going to take care of them and, you know, all of the, and, and now they're 22 or 25 and, and you haven't done anything in years to it and your entire financial situation has changed. You've got, you know, you don't have beneficiaries named properly. Maybe you wrote the wills and trusts, you know, originally when you had your first child, but now you got three kids and yeah, it's just probate and it's just all these different questions. And honestly, all the laws change constantly. Healthcare directives, power of attorneys, you know, maybe you're on the outs with uh, Uncle Joey and you don't want him handling your money, you know, if something happens to you for your kids <laughs> and, and one of them is, you know, under eight, you know, it's like there's just a lot of things that change. And I think the biggest black hole piece that we can pass off to people is that you got to keep that moving forward regularly. That, that's just part of the, the good stewardship piece that has to happen. I, yep. There's a thousand bad stories, a zillion bad stories on the estate world. There's very few good ones. 
<laughs> we don't we're not going to break into those we we have another opportunity down the road but i will say with administration changing um in that trust piece especially that's you, you want to be taking a look at that those of you that have already gone through and set up the trust sit down understand what's coming down the pipe uh, or potentially and what you need to at least consider in making any of those changes number 14 make planning a regular conversation. And I think this will really help you out too because, you know, Ben was talking about going out and having dinner and, and making that something that's enjoyable. Um, you know, don't make it the the gut wrenching, you know, sit down and and argue about, you know, everything that we possibly can money. You know, let's let's try to make this something that is is really enjoyable. The more that you can make it something that you look forward to, you know, go out, have dinner, whatever it is that you guys like to do, um, you know, go for a walk. And I, I like that one a lot is because you can really start to get some endorphins going and that's going to help and benefit. Your mind is going to be thinking differently as you're, as, as you're in that, that place. Um, and you, you might come up with completely different ideas, but, at least get those out there and have the conversations on a, on a regular basis. Number 15, Ben. Number 15 is not only good for you, it's good for them. I, I would always say, talk to people who are retired, you know, engage people who are already living both the pros and the cons, the successes and the failures of all that they've, you know, worked for and worked hard for. You know, I, I gotta tell you, there's a lot of things I've learned from so many people that said, you know, I wish I had done this, or I wish I had done it that way. I mean, you know, wisdom from others is is just invaluable. And in this space, you're going to find out, hey, you know what, I, I, I bought the house. I mean, I've met people who say, you know, I bought a house in Tennessee or North Carolina, or, you know, I thought that would be nicer. And it, honestly, some of the winters were colder than I really wanted it to be. And Florida was really the place I needed to be. And then you're like, well, what part of Florida? And you know, just or or Arizona. You know, it was it was too humid here, and I I went to you know. There's a zillion different questions and things of why people like what they like and don't. And you may not like what they're doing, but if anything, that tells you, well, I definitely don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, like I don't want to be near that city, or I don't want to be in this area, or you know, there's just a. I can think of all sorts of different concerns people had. You know, I really wish I had you know, maybe bought a place earlier and enjoyed it younger, you know, with my husband because he passed away so soon. And we, for years regretted, we we could have done it. We could have bought a place in Florida and done it. I mean, that was, that's something that someone said to me once. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, you know? And um, those are, those are conversations that I think you can't lose from. And honestly, they're going to enjoy company. I mean, everyone enjoys company, especially in retirement. I was mentioning my friend of mine who was, you know, trying to, you know, thinking he was going to retire for basically six months or a year and see what happened. And he, he couldn't, he was just, didn't want to be home anymore. I mean, that was just part of it. Is this another friend? Because we, we were talking about somebody else earlier that <laughs> that's a very common thing. We find a lot of people. And that's the thing. I think if you're, if you're engaging retirees and change it, you know, if you, if you've only know your, your aunt and uncle that are retired currently, or your mom or dad, you know, seek out other people as well. And, you know, it, it's awesome. It's a great opportunity to build a relationship. You'd be surprised how many people, even if you don't know them very well, would be open and receptive to having conversations like this. And I think what we find is that a lot of the time there's some principles that are very common. Uh, the stories are different, but there's there really is some underlying principles in, in throughout or a theme throughout that you can start to tie together and create your own your own story of what you want retirement to look like. Very true. Folks, we've had a lot of fun here. Uh, well, Ben and I had, you know, two hours of fun trying to figure out our technical difficulties before we even hopped on here. So <laughs> I think this is going to be a great day. I can't wait to see what this week shapes up like and to hear from you, uh, your stories of uh, what, what you found successful and how are you putting together your retirement. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. You can also find us at Facebook. We're at backslash 3D investing. We're also on Twitter at BFG underscore LLC. And as always, you can also find us at yourmoneyontap.com. 
Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking our podcast. We appreciate you and we can't wait to make it a great day and a great life with you here at Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit or protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group, LLC, are independent of Sage Point Financial. Sage Point Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551.